Teju Ravi Lochun, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much, Howie. It's a pleasure to be with you. So before we get to the reason that I reached out, because you know you sent an email about this really beautiful, wonderful story, um, let's let's remind folks who you are, what you do, what you care about, um, just for maybe for folks who have not uh, consumed our, our first conversation. Sure, <clears throat> my name is Teju, and um, I I. I'm the son of Indian immigrants, um, and I kind of grew up my whole life um, seeing an American perspective on things and and then also seeing an Indian perspective on things. And um, and especially my uh, Indian heritage has taught me a lot about community. And, of course, my American heritage has taught me a lot about, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit and agency and that sort of thing. <clears throat> but I think... As I've grown older, I've 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 longed for a kind of community where we all really look after each other and take care of each other, like I have seen in subcultures in the U.S. and also in India. And so, when the pandemic began, I started an organization called Gather Four, piloting in New York, and uh, the premise is in community we have everything we need. And so we have been organizing neighbors into teams of five to seven to support each other like a family. That might look like listening to each other, just checking in and talking. It might look like helping each other find food or bringing over food when someone is sick or unwell. It might look like watching each other's kids or pooling funds to pay off bills. Um, those sorts of things, essentially being there for one another through thick and thin, just like a family would. And then we link these teams of neighbors together in sort of a neighborhood safety net and help this whole um, group of, of neighbors to build the neighborhood and the community that they want to see. So we've been doing that for about two and a half years and um, still in our early days, doing a lot of experimentation to understand how we kind of weave this community fabric. Uh, but that's, that's uh, what I've been getting to learn from and play with in the last few years. Gotcha. So there's, there's a lot of, um, sort of social science research that might suggest that this isn't going to work, right? <laughs> like, so, you know, the tragedy of the commons or, you know, everyone's worried, mm. like, you know, what, you know, am I giving more than I'm going to get? Uh, what mm. if I don't like the people? You know, it's like, you know, old communities, you were, when I lived in South Africa, we had to be friends with our neighbors because when the, when the fires came, you needed your neighbor's truck with a, you know, mm. with, with water on the back and they needed like there was there was need. It was not negotiable. But mm. like living in New York, it feels like ev every relationship except for maybe immediate family is kind of negotiable and you could come and go as you please. What what have you found in terms of, you know, human nature and the structure of society that allowed people to to make these leaps of of mutual support? Mm. That's a deep question. It's a good question. I, I'm i still learning about this. I think our cultural training, Howie, is exactly as you're describing, that we should be self-sufficient, we should be individuals, we should be able to take care of ourselves. And I'm not wholly dismissing that. I think there's something wise in that teaching um, that we've received. And I think we can, of course, take it too far because everything that we do if we really look deeply at it, we see that we are caught, as Martin Luther King said, in an inescapable web of mutuality. We see that mm -hmm. to eat a tomato, how many hands have touched that tomato from pre-seed to it being on our plate? Um, if we walk on the road, who built that road? Living in our home, who built that home? Sure, we may be spending money on some of these things, but between us and that money is a whole web of human beings that we may never know. Um, and other beings, animals, plants, um, the sun, the sky, the ocean, all enabling us to get our needs met. And so I think that giving people the opportunity to step into a community is giving them an opportunity to step into what they inherently know is true about how we live. Humans are a social species. We have always relied on each other to 
to meet our needs. You know, you don't think of ants or wolves meeting their needs on their own. You know, they do it together and that's how we do it too. Um, and so, so yes, there is this veil of capitalism, of transaction over all these interactions. But of course, within that, we have enormous subcultures of people who are caring for each other no matter what, you know. Um, mm. And my family, for example, I learned a lot from them. My parents were immigrants to the United States. They came here with $200. Of course, they were educated, um, which is a big privilege to have. Um, they were trained as doctors. But, you know, when they came here, they didn't know how to navigate the system. You know, they're still learning English to a degree. They're, you know, they were able to stay with my uncle who gave them a place to stay. They were able to meet someone who helped my father land his first residency position in neurosurgery in Colorado. Um, and once we went there, I remember all these people from work, or my dad's work, who would come and help us move and get settled. You know, my parents were able to, with their limited funds, put a $500 down, dollar down payment on uh, an affordable housing, you know, um, home, which was incredible. So there were so many ways in which we were enabled by other people, by community, by supportive efforts from the government, etc., to start life here. Um, and so I think, I think that if we look deeply at our own lives, we see that we cannot be where we are without our parents, our siblings, our friends, our teachers, the person who loaned us $5 when we ran out of lunch money, the person who, you know, um, who, um, you know, spotted us at the grocery store one day or all these acts of kindness that have made our lives possible. And so I think, you know, it's it's giving people an opportunity to step into that reality and ask them, what do you think of this? Does this work for you? Do you want to keep going? Do you want to deepen in this practice? I think that's the experiment that we have been trying. Like one of the things I'm thinking, like we just, my family just moved over here to Spain and, you know, our plan is to stay for at least a year, which means residency, which means like taxes. And I was looking at the Spanish tax brackets. And I, I don't understand much, but I do understand that it looks like it's going to be a lot higher. And I found my American brain was like, okay, now what can I do to minimize my tax burden? Like, should I change my S corp into a C corp? And, and like, like it, was, it was a little bit shocking. Like my first thought is, well, I want to get all this great stuff from Spain. You know, every day the, the cleaning trucks come down the street and, and, they pick things up and, um, you know, there's police presence for festivals that are going on here. And like, there's so much that is, you know, subsidized um, transportation, public transportation. I don't need a car here. And yet my brain is still going, okay, how can I get all this stuff without contributing back? Mm. Right. I think that reciprocity and mutuality are hallmarks of strong community and strong relationships. You know, the the friendships that we have in our lives that are the most meaningful are often ones where we can both give and receive and, and living in community, that's an extraordinary practice. It feels really good to be able to give from our gifts and to be able to receive the gifts of other people, you know? And so I it is it is it is unusual and it's difficult because in the US and in other places, we're taught not to ask for help or that that's a shameful thing. And, um, you know, we're taught to sort of just mind our own sphere and, and work on that. Um, but of course, we know that, you know, that run gets us into trouble really quickly, you know, because our neighbor's actions affect us. You know, um, if they're using the river upstream from us and they they don't steward that river, you know, with consideration for their downstream neighbors needs as well, then of course there's an impact. And so if we really start to investigate the story that we're told, you know, it gives us an opportunity to tell a more beautiful, more nuanced, more whole story that captures exactly what's going on and the reality of that. And if we think about some of our darkest moments in this life, maybe we've made it through some of those moments, what have been the factors that have supported us in moving through those moments. Maybe we lost a loved one. Maybe we go through a breakup. Maybe we lose a job. Maybe we lose a sense of purpose. What is it in those moments that guides us through? Mm. And for many of us, the answer is other people, both support 
and love of other people. And those, you cannot undervalue um, the importance of those moments. And so I think that's just what we're stepping into. I don't think that if we really, you know, got into it, no one would find this totally shocking or surprising. Um, it, it, it would just be about coming back to some of our experiences where we have found that we do really need each other. Just as you were saying, like when we need each other in, in South Africa, it does create this sense of relationship. And and um, and so we're trying to peel back the that story a little bit. Like, is it true that we don't need each other, that we can actually be self-sufficient? Or in fact, are we interdependent? And how do we step into that more deeply? Mm. So what, one of the the hallmarks of the story that I'd love to get into with you is around power and powerlessness and how the the myth of the self-made person works for the people at the top in certain ways for a while um, because they can afford an army of underlings or you know the the technology to uh, sort of outsource parts of themselves but for people living on the margins, um, trying to survive on your own and, and imbibing this, this sort of, you know, individualistic ethos, like, oh, though so-and-so is, is a, you know, rich, self-made person, so that's how I should be. Um, right. Right. So let's, maybe we can, we can, we can segue into the, the story itself. Of, of this sure. um, commu community living living in a pretty neglected, rundown building in New York City, right? Can you kind of give us the, the setup? Yeah, absolutely. So um, about a year ago, I first met residents of Glenmore Plaza. Glenmore Plaza is a public housing development in Brownsville, Brooklyn, in New York. And public housing in New York is administered by the New York City Housing Authority, which is nicknamed NYCHA, N-Y-C-H-A. And um, NYCHA built Glenmore Plaza, I believe, in the 1950s or 60s. And at that time, it was this extraordinary, modern, beautiful building with this nice courtyard. People really wanted to live there. Um, and uh, and indeed, a lot of the residents who are still there today, you know, moved in in the 90s or the 80s or, or things like that. So they've been there a long time. They've grown up there. And um, when I went there, it was with the intention of sharing our work with Gather4 and how we want to organize neighbors into teams to support each other. And I come with the invitation of the resident association president, the resident association board. The resident association is a group of residents that meet every month um, to talk about what's going on in the building. And in particular, they coordinate with the super and manager of the building, representatives of NYCHA to make sure that things are being fixed in the building, that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, residents in this meeting first started with talking with the super and the manager before I shared anything. And they were very, very angry about the state of disrepair in the building. And the, the super and the manager of the building responded by saying, look, all you need to do is, is get a work order for any of the repairs that you need. Go onto the app, the NYCHA app, call our call center, let them know the repair that's needed, follow the proper procedure or protocol. And sort of suggested that the reason that residents hadn't been getting repairs was because they weren't doing their job. They weren't calling the call center. They weren't getting the work order or getting their ticket number. Um, and one woman shared a story, her name is Barbara Cole, about how she had tried to get a ticket number and a work order on many occasions to have a grab bar installed in her bathroom. She has seizures and uh, she wanted the grab bar there to steady herself in case she fell, in case she was about to fall because she was having a seizure. Her doctors recommended this. And she told this to NYCHA about 30 years ago when she first moved in. And NYCHA did not respond at all. And not only weeks went by or months went by, four years went by with no action from NYCHA. And she tragically had a seizure in the bathroom without anything to hold on to, fell, cracked two of her ribs, hit her skull, which was fractured, and required brain surgery. She spent months and months recovering. 
And finally, when she recovered, she contacted NYCHA again and said, this is what happened to me. Please fix this. Please install a grab bar. You know, I don't want to get hurt again like this. It would really make a major difference in my safety if you would do this. And NYCHA still did not respond for another 27 years. Until And, and at the moment she told the story, they still hadn't responded. So she was sharing, essentially, it's not just about following the NYCHA protocol. Something else is going on. We're not getting our needs addressed. And other residents at that meeting shared angrily and frustratedly, understandably, that they had similar stories. Mm-hmm. So and, can, can I interrupt? Like, I'm trying to put myself in your position. Like, I'm coming in. I'm all gung-ho to share this positive message I've got like my notes, I've practiced my pitch, I've given it a hundred times and I'm showing up and these people are just bitching about something that's not entirely, like I can imagine myself getting sort of like, no, 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 like focus on this, <laughs> mm. right? Like, like, like I'm, on your behalf, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like I would not necessarily have had the grace to, to to think expansively. So I'm, I'm wondering, like, mm-hmm. as you were listening to this, like, was what was sort of going through your head as your agenda seemed to have been, you know, s- s- subordinated? Hmm. Well, I mean, I was shocked. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And I, you know, was really astounded by the state of conditions. And, and I think I can, I, I'm a visitor, you know, to this community. And I was aware of that. I'm, I'm not, you know, everyone else in the room was black. I wasn't black. Everyone else is from New York. I'm not from New York. Everyone else lives in this building. I don't live in this building. So, you know, when you go to a new country, for example, and you are a foreigner, maybe some of us, at least, there's some kind of awareness of we don't speak the language. We don't know the customs. We don't, know, you know, so we're trying to attune and trying to take clues from the people that are there, whatever our agenda or our goals, you know, there has to be this openness, this humility to recognize that we don't know the story. We don't know what's going on here. And so I was there as much to learn what's going on in this community as I was to offer this idea that I had. And when it came time for me to present, I did start presenting and nobody was listening because They were very upset about the interaction they had just had with the manager and the supervisor who didn't really seem to hear them or listen to them. And so I asked if we should take a break. We took a break. We came back and I I again started giving the presentation, but it just wasn't really landing. So I just started asking questions like, so this repair issue has been going on for a while. You know, what have you all tried to deal with it? Have you ever tried coming together as a community and speaking with one voice to NYCHA? Do you think that would be effective or not? And a lot of them shared that they had not tried that, but there was not a lot of trust and interest in connecting, you know, among the residents. Um, People were in and out of the building. They were transient. They had different schedules, different lives. And, you know, there was a lot of vandalism, safety concerns in the building. People would sometimes sleep in the hallways or in the stairwells. People would be passed out with heroin needles in their arms. I mean, these are the projects of Brooklyn. These are... These are are places that people who live there don't feel safe. There's gun violence, there's sexual harassment and assault that happens in the halls and elevators. People did not feel comfortable coming together with their neighbors, you know, knocking on their neighbor's door. One one person suggested would potentially cause a fight. So Mm -hmm. this is the this is the setup. So I was really stunned and shocked and I did feel a bit forlorn in that moment because here I am with this hopeful dream about how we could all come together in community and take care of each other. And, and there's such disenfranchisement, such fracturing among people who live in one building. That's how I was feeling, you know, in that, in that moment. Mm. So the story could have ended right there, right? But it didn't. So what, what happened next? So um, I spoke to a mentor who does community organizing and supports a lot of residents of NYCHA buildings to get repairs, get other needs met. And I asked him how he does it. And he said, it's it's a five-step process. First, you get a team of eight to 12 residents together. And that team goes door knocking 
to collect repair needs. Um, then um, you synthesize all that information in a spreadsheet and you send it to the right upper management official at NYCHA and you ask that, that NYCHA official to come to a meeting with the residents. And at that meeting, the residents will share their, um, their demands essentially. And ideally the press is there and you have about a fourth of the residents of the building to indicate that it's serious and it warrants a visit from the NYCHA official and from the press. And then you get NYCHA to make a commitment to taking action on the issue. So five steps, form a team, go door to door and get repairs, um, synthesize it in a spreadsheet and send it to the right official at NYCHA, host a meeting, with uh, the press and that NYCHA official with at least a fourth of the residents of the building. And then finally have NYCHA commit to a, a plan of action, getting those needs addressed. That's mm -hmm. what Robbie told me had worked well um, for them in the past, his organizing um, organization. Mm -hmm. So I heard that and I was a bit, um, I was excited that it's some, there's something that can be done, but I was also a bit concerned because I saw that adversarial dynamic between the residents and the NYCHA representatives in the building in that meeting. And I just thought that this was playing into that adversarial dynamic. There's NYCHA, this faceless government institution, and they're the residents of NYCHA and they are at odds. NYCHA believes the residents don't take good care of the property. They don't do their job. They don't follow protocols and getting repairs done. You know, meanwhile, they're understaffed, under-resourced, overwhelmed, dealing with 177,000 apartments. They're the largest housing authority in all of New York, and they are, according to them, $78 billion underfunded to do the job they have to do. And they feel like every time they do something that they think is good or is right, they're met with more needs, more frustration, more um, um, frustration. They are not getting any appreciation or gratitude anytime. And so there are humans who work at NYCHA and that's, you know, that's a hard thing to sit with. On the other hand, you have residents like Barbara Cole who are potentially going to die if these repairs aren't made. You know, that's how serious the lack of repairs are. People are breathing in mold, children are breathing in mold or lead paint. Um, you know, their walls are soft to the touch and might fall apart. There's rats running around their apartments and in their in their in their trash cans and 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 they don't feel at ease or safe at home and so of course they are upset and hurt and in pain and frustrated and feel powerless. This is what this is what's going on and so this group is trying to get this group to do something and this group is under resourced to do the job essentially. So that's the dynamic. So then I had a friend who named Jordan Reeves, um, who I was just chatting with casually about a totally unrelated topic, who happened to tell me the story of, of how when they were living in Williamsburg in 2017, they as a, as a um, queer trans non-binary person would walk home from work and often be harassed by other people in the neighborhood. And um, it was such a problem that they tried to approach the cops, they uh, approached local officials and neighborhood watch but nothing would solve the problem. And they were getting you know, insulted. Um, um, people were using very derogatory words toward them. And um, people also threw bottles and trash and fireworks, at, launched fireworks at them. So they were physically unsafe. And uh, they had a mentor, Anuj Bandari, who is a community organizer who said, you know what you really need to do is you need to meet these people and shake their hands. And if somehow you could do that, then maybe this issue would stop for you. So this sparked an idea for Jordan, which was to host a block party. And so they got Whole Foods to donate pizza and Shake Shack to donate ice cream and they got waters and they you know, talked to people in the community about what they'd like to see in a block party. And they had this beautiful event, they called it Kindness Party. And they had kids and people like draw kind messages of chalk on the sidewalks and 400 people came. And uh, indeed Jordan met their abusers, um, their harassers. And they said to Jordan, you did this? Like, this is amazing. No one has ever done something like this for our community. And they shook hands. And ever after that, they never harassed Jordan. They in fact defended and protected Jordan from other people in the community. Mm. They would sometimes escort or walk Jordan home so they get there safely. They would say, hey, how you doing? It changed their relationship 
and it made a lot more people in the community feel safe. So I heard this story and I was like, Jordan, this is absolutely incredible. And it made me think about what would happen if we combined the community organizing framework that Robbie gave me and this kindness party idea that Jordan shared. And then we tried this to help bridge this divide between NYCHA and the residents and it worked extraordinarily well. So we got eight residents um, in the community together. It was hard to get them to volunteer, but we got them to volunteer and they call themselves the Glenmore Proud because they want to be proud to live at Glenmore again. And they went door to door and they collected the repair needs of over 100 apartments in the development. And, um, and they pu we put it all in a spreadsheet. We sent it to Dan Green, who's the executive vice president of property management operations at NYCHA. So he's in charge of repairs for all of New York NYCHA houses. And he and we said, we're going to throw a block party in three months to celebrate you, NYCHA, getting all these repairs done. <laughs> the community is going to be there. The press is going to be there. All you have to do is do the repairs. Will you do it? And NYCHA said yes. And over the next three months, they worked in a, at a pace the residents had never seen. They, made, they responded to over 1,626 work orders. They responded to 90% of the repair requests that residents had made in that time, in two months. They, um, they moved at three times faster, at least, than they had moved at their fastest pace in making repairs. Um, and, and Barbara Cole, that woman who didn't have her grab bar installed, got her grab bar installed within four days. People who had been waiting five years for pipes to be fixed finally got their pipes fixed. Um, people who had been waiting for painting or door replacements or lock replacements or um, tiles that were falling down or mold removal, all have got those things fixed. NYCHA moved extraordinarily quickly in getting it done. Um, and then on the day of, of kindness party, they came out. We had about 400 people there as well. We had free food that our community members cooked. Um, we fed the people in the residence. We fed people from nearby homeless shelters for free. We had resources from mental health support to child care support to rental assistance uh, from different partner organizations. We gave away aquarium tickets, $50 Target gift cards. We just had this amazing gathering. The um, assembly woman came. Um, the city council member's office showed up and gave a check of $422,000 to the residents to support repairs to the doors in their building. Um, it was it was an amazing success, and it it really all hinged on this insight of accountability through celebration, inviting NYCHA into a team effort instead of demonizing them, breaking through this animosity between the residents and NYCHA, and moving toward true collaboration, true teamwork. Um, that's what that's what ha wound up happening. Hmm. So it seems so simple. And part of me, I think, and part of people who are listening to this are going to say like, oh, I get, I get why that worked. But there's also a part of me that's like, I don't know why that worked. <laughs> like why, you know, why was there such a transformational change in the relationship with NYCHA in their response, you know, moving from adversarial, like what, how do you explain this? Yeah. Well, um, I think it's because we often appeal to the head, especially when we're dealing with government, um, or we often loudly declare injustice, you know, and, and both of those things are fair and, and there's and important, and I don't think we should stop. And they may not always reach people. There's something about appealing to the heart and also honoring others. Um, and so, for example, when we met, we had a meeting between the Glenmore Proud, the eight women who were part of our organizing committee and Dan Green and some of the other upper management executives at NYCHA. And as we prepared for that meeting, the members of the Glenmore Proud had anger and they wanted to be like, why hasn't this happened? Why hasn't this happened? And I said, you know, 
we should definitely talk about those things. Like it's important for us to be real. But also, what if we start with appreciation? What if we begin by acknowledging what has happened, you know? And so every one of them started with thank you. And they shared a story about a repair in their own apartment that needed to be made that NYCHA addressed. And it totally changed the tenor of this conversation. NYCHA came in a bit defensive because how could you not be? If every time you show up and you meet with residents, they're upset with you, they're yelling at you. Suddenly here are people who are saying, thank you. Thank you for what you have done for me, for my children, for my sense of home, for my sense of safety, thank you. I see what you have done and it is extraordinarily appreciated. Also, these are concerns I still have. If you say that, as opposed to, why haven't these things been done from the get-go? Mm -hmm. It tremendously changes the openness someone has to listening to you and hearing you because you were seen, you were acknowledged, you were honored, you know, your efforts were honored and acknowledged. And that's what we were wondering about in this whole process is, you know, NYCHA as, a, as an institution, they have power, they have resources, they have challenges, They've been corrupt and, and found, you know, guilty of corruption in the past. In 2018, for example, they claimed not to use lead-based paints in particular apartments in the Bronx, I believe. And um, they were found to have used lead-based paints and found to have trained employees and staff to lie about it. And, and there was a class action lawsuit brought against them. The HUD cut funding for them, brought in federal oversight. The CEO at the time was fired. You know, there's real issues of corruption within NYCHA. And, you know, we cannot paint everyone with a broad brushstroke. Not everyone at NYCHA is part of that corruption, operates that way. A lot of the people that we got to know in the process of working with NYCHA have lived in NYCHA houses themselves from childhood. They've even grown up in Brownsville where we're doing this work. They've even grown up in Glenmore Plaza where they've been working with Glenmore Plaza. They are motivated by a desire to help people. And so, what happens if we start by like seeing each other? If I see you, it makes it more possible for you to see me. And when we see each other, then we can work together. I think that is the key thing that we try to do here is take the time and the space to start there and to focus there. Doesn't mean that we can't be real. Doesn't mean that we can't talk about what's actually going on. That has to happen. Mm -hmm. But the tenor, the tone, the container for it all is different. Um, when it's couched in acknowledgement, appreciation, and celebration, and not in blame, antagonism, um, and frustration, and that was the that was the cultural shift, the tonal shift that we were trying to make. Mm. So there's something about that that feels like a par a little bit of a paradox, and like the word like when I was thinking, hearing you talk about Jordan Reeves and throwing a block party for their tormentors, like the word that popped into my head was fawning. Or right? like appeasement like, or something, right? Yeah, yeah, like I'm so, you know, I'm too weak to do anything about it. So, in order, right, it's it's almost like, you know, sort of, it's blaming, it's, it's not necessarily blaming the victim, but it's saying, you're the one who's got to take the step. Mm -hmm. How, you know... <laughs> Yes. Right. It's, there's something in that that seems really tough. I mean, so I think that, I mean, this goes really deep. This goes really, really deep. I think that why is it that someone would throw bottles at somebody else? Why would they throw trash at somebody else or shoot fireworks at them or make them feel unsafe? And, you know, we, that is not okay, that's not acceptable. But you know, when you exhaust the options that we normally rely on, a force, of punishment, et cetera, and you find that they don't work, you know, you do not have that recourse. You know, what are the other options that you have? Well, maybe you could carry a gun, you know, flash that around a little bit if people harass you. Um, and, and of course, if you do that, you know, then what will happen? Um, what happens next? And so I think this is always the, 
this is the difficulty that we find ourselves in, this sort of arms race, this quest for increasing power, this quest for increasing dominance, the ability to display our strength to, uh, to prevent people from attacking us. And actually, that is that comes from a wound. It comes from a wound of insecurity. It comes from a wound of not feeling like we can trust people around us. So we have to control them and we have to build and build and build power. And, you know, many of us don't have that capacity. Some of us do have that capacity, um, but those are people who arguably feel the least safe of all. You know, Plato in the Republic wrote about this problem over 2000 years ago. Um, he said the least um, peaceful person, the least harmonious person, the least happy person in society is the tyrant, the one hmm. with all the power, all the resources. Why is that? Because the tyrant has no true friend. They cannot truly trust anyone. They don't know if they're loved for who they are or for their power and their wealth. And so they're always afraid that everyone is trying to take their power and their wealth from them. And so they have to use their power and their wealth to protect their power and their wealth. And they're always looking over their shoulder. This is the endless life that they are leading. It's not a life of safety, of ease, of peace, of comfort, any of those kinds of things. It's, it's, it's a life of vigilance and relentlessness and loneliness. And if you think about who are the powerful and wealthy people in our world and how happy do we see them as being? If we think of Donald Trump, the president of the United States, how happy do we think that this person is, you know? How happy do we think that Jeff Bezos is or Bill Gates is or any of these people who have power and wealth and who've spent that time and effort protecting their power and their wealth and trying to develop more power and wealth at all costs? Mark Zuckerberg, you know, instead of enjoying daiquiris on the beach with, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, they're always trying to find ways to make more money to protect their reputations in public, etc., so there's a wound, there's a wound underneath the quest for power and it comes from this sense of insecurity. And what is it that actually heals that wound? And I, I, I don't know the answer, but part of the exploration for me is what heals that wound may actually have more to do with helping people see us and value us by being fiercely who we are, by being authentic. This is what the... Mm. What the queer movement has taught us, for example, at risk of their own lives, many queer people in the 1970s, you know, starting at the Stonewall Inn in New York, came up with this idea of let's come out, let's be who we are. And they lost their lives, they lost their families, um, they were attacked and hurt, and it was unsafe for a lot of them, and, and they found ways to protect each other and, and, and create safety as well. But I don't want to gloss over that part of it. But then also, suddenly you're a congressperson with a nephew who is gay. Suddenly you're a carpenter with a daughter who's trans. Suddenly you are, are you know people who you love and who care about who are, who are queer. And you have to wrestle with your worldview and loving them mm -hmm. and accepting them. And there's something about that that is shifting and changing our culture. And that cultural shift is making queer people today safer than they were in the 1970s. And did they have the options of amassing military force or, or, or you know, having their own media outlet and, and all of these other things? No. The most powerful thing that they could do was to be free, to be who they are. And so I think that actually the, the truest practice of power is – to see and be seen and to form such deep connection and trust with people that we know we are held in safety and in care. That if you hurt me, you don't only hurt me, you hurt everyone in this community and you hurt yourself. You take my life. If you spit on me, if you insult me, if you, if you attack me, you will lose the trust and the care and the connection to all the people who are in this community who might hold you and care for you. That's what I think increasingly we have to work toward. And is it naive and idealistic? I sometimes fear that in saying this message, it will land that way with people. But that's what I'm learning from what we have done. I mean, again, if we look at like, from that's what I'm learning from like ancestors and historical teachers. If we look at the, at the civil rights movement, 
you know, there were, of course, people within the movement who wanted to, um, you know, who wanted to build an army and create a new United States. And I think there are probably still some people who want to do that, who want to arm themselves and, and fight the power in that way. And, and I understand that. And I don't fault it at all, given the way that we have continued to treat people of country and uh, color in this country. Um, but what wound up being more effective, perhaps, was this approach of, like, this is who we are. See us and ask yourselves, you know, like, is this who you want to be in how you treat us and how you relate? And indeed, you know, when the U.S. was trying to build allies during the Cold War and they went to other countries to, you know, and those countries were like, how do you how do we know that you will care for us or be a good partner to us when you treat your own people of color so poorly? Um, and it became something that because the civil rights movement had made visible the injustice they were facing, you know, the United States shifted policy. So I think the point I'm trying to make in a lot of words is there's extraordinary power in authenticity and there's extraordinary power in starting by seeing someone else so that they see you. And I think that's that's why this work is very, very important, um, even for marginalized people to do. You know, Paulo Freire writes in Pedagogy of the Oppressed that the people who are most likely to challenge reality are the people who are marginalized and oppressed because it's not working for them. They're not just going to accept things the way they are. And they are best positioned to do so, in fact, because they they know a different way is possible and they are imagining alternatives all the time. You know, so I think that's that's part of part of this work is honoring the gift sometimes of experiencing oppression and what it teaches us about resilience, what it teaches us about power. You know, as a last point, if you've lived your life, if there's let's say there's two rooms in the house, one room with light and one room in, in the darkness that doesn't have light. If you have lived your whole life in this light room, you are very afraid of going into the room of darkness. Hmm. You know what it's like to live in there, right? But if you've lived your life in this room of darkness, you can freely move back and forth between the, the room in, that's in the dark and the room that's in the light. If these are the people who've experienced oppression, marginalization, powerlessness, et cetera, and, and, and I, I, won't, I won't call it true powerlessness, it's sort of a, um, the narrative of powerlessness, there is, a, there is an extraordinary power and capacity they have that many people who are privileged, who have never experienced this kind of oppression, do not have, a freedom that they have. And, and, and that's, that's, that's part of what's going on here, you know, is I think when Jordan, you know, stands up for who he is and says, it's okay for me to be who I am and not to fit in this narrow box, this narrow light room. I can be all these things. I can go back and forth to these places. That is even more free. You know, so there's a gift and a power in that experience sometimes, I think, of growing up and finding an, an oppression and finding resilience and finding the ability to be able to hold that and keep moving. Mm. So what came to me while, while you were sharing that is, especially when you're talking about, um, you know, the people who have experienced oppression and marginalization are the ones who are most open and available to new possibilities. Um, a year or so ago, I had someone on my podcast, a uh, social scientist and psychologist, Todd Cashdan, who wrote about systems justification theory, which is the idea that the people with the least, with the, with the least are often the most bought into the system because they have the most to lose if it goes down. And hmm. what, what occurred to me is that that's probably true until you bring your ethos into it. Because if, you know, if you're like, when I was listening to you describe the, um, the, the conditions in Glenmore Plaza, like I just kept hearing it from a polyvagal neurological perspective, like you're in constant fight or flight. Yeah. And what I heard happening is that through trust, through community, through a lens of appreciation that people's nervous systems were able to relax. And, you know, when you're in fight or flight, all you're doing is looking to avoid bad stuff. 
when when that calms down, your natural creativity and generative capacity and the ability to see bigger horizons naturally comes online. And I'm wondering if that's if that's how we can can um, kind of resolve that paradox of you know poor powerless people sticking with the leader as opposed mm. to acting in their in their true self interests. Gosh, yeah, this again, this goes really, really deep and, and, and it's so complex and I don't, you know, presume to have the truth about any of this. And I, you know, my perspective is one of, of many, you know, as we're trying to find our way, you know, and part of a collective movement of people who are trying to find our way, you know, together and, and even trying different things and even contrasting approaches sometimes. Um, I do think that there is you know, there's a, a writer, Brian Stout, who I really appreciate. And he says that there's three fundamental disconnects or pains in our world today. That is a disconnection from ourself, a disconnection from our community, and a disconnection from our earth. And in order to keep power, dominator cultures, whether that's white supremacy or patriarchy or capitalism or any of these kinds of imperialism, they work to disconnect us from those sources of power self community earth when we can't grow our own food we need to depend on the system of markets and and big ag and that sort of thing to have food you know um and that means we need to have food stamps or we need to have enough money to buy food or when we can't build our own house and we don't have the light the rights to do that or the space to do that we have we are left to the market and we have to participate in the market and our whole lives get shaped around these things. And so indeed, you know, when we are, these options are taken away from us, we are forced to play a game that is maybe not the game that we, that we want to play. But of course, when the rules change, extraordinary things can happen. Did you know, for example, that during World War II, 70% of US domestic food production came from people's front yards, from victory gardens, as they were called, there was a campaign to get people to grow their own food uh, because all the food that was being mass produced was being sent to the war in Europe and in Japan and so in Asia. And so um, people had to grow their own food and we grew 70% of our own food in that time. People in their front yards did that. We have forgotten this story and we have forgotten that skill and we have returned to, you know, beginning in the 1950s, the TV dinners and the, and the, you know, all these of this big culture around agriculture and, and, and participating in that system, because, you know, we can really quickly wipe away alternatives. We can say this was a thing we were doing during the war, but we're not doing it anymore. Yeah. And so reconnecting to those, to those three things, the earth, our community and ourselves is really important. How do we reconnect to ourselves? We have been taught that we don't have power. We have been taught that we must be individual and self-sufficient, which is part of a campaign to disconnect us from our community and the earth. Um, we have been, you know, we have been taught um, what is power. You know, power is physical strength. Power is anger. Power is this. It looks this particular narrow way, but we are so much more than that as humans. We have so many other capacities, and there are times when anger really works. Am I saying this is always what we should do? We should always have accountability through celebration? No. You know, the skilled carpenter knows when to use a hammer, when to use a saw, when to use a, a wrench, depending on the job that's needed. In this context, this was the tool to use, maybe. Um, is, it, is it always going to be? I can't make that statement or claim at all. Um, and, and so, but yes, in this moment, people had to begin by finding their own power through connection and community with each other and seeing that when they started to take an action, it had a result. So now this community is transformed. The culture I was telling you in this building of people not wanting to knock on each other's doors, that changed. People are hugging each other. People are telling each other how much they appreciate each other. People are saying, whatever you need, I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to do this for you. Something is transformed in this community because they saw the power they had together and they are appreciative. Mm -hmm. So when you see that, now you feel like I could do anything. That is a danger to the powers that be, for example, unless you say, look, we're building this new world and you're part of it too. We want, you invite, we want to invite you into it too. 
they might have been hurt and pain. It's not like we can just forget about that. We need to heal from that. We need to have accountability for that, you know? Um, but that I think is what we have been trying here in our own small way in this particular context, you know? And that's, I think, I do think it is a big, you know, nervous system shift for people to go from that frustration, anger, fight or flight to I can be in my body. I can see, I can feel a little bit more ease here. I have more space to imagine. And now you know what the, mm. the residents are planning? They're saying we can use everyone's gifts here. We have seniors, we have kids. What if we had seniors and kids make signs that help people understand the behaviors that can maintain our building now that it's been repaired? Prevention is better than cure. So if we all take our trash to the trash compactor, we will avoid rats coming back to our apartments. If we can help people understand, you know, not to dump grease down their, down their sinks, you know, that gums up the plumbing down the road and, and we'll have leaks and those kinds of issues. So if you see a child who with glitter and crayon has a sign in the hallway that says, I live here and I love clean water. And I, you know, if we gum up our pipes by pouring in grease, you know, that's going to hurt us. So cease the grease, you know, whatever it might be, but like, if that's the next idea that they're imagining, they're coming up and they want to tell their story to other developments, other in, in, the, in the building. So something has changed for them where they're thinking expansively, their capacity for imagination has grown tremendously because they have seen what they can do. They've seen themselves and their own power. They're seeing themselves in a, in, with more clear eyes you know, and not with this message as black people, as black women, as black poor women, um, in a in a neglected neighborhood that they have no power. That's the message we've told them as a society for countless years. And they're saying, actually, it's not true. We can interrupt that story. And there's something new that, that we're getting to see in ourselves. And so that, I think, is part of healing that connection to self, mm -hmm. healing that connection to community. And hopefully over time, we can also heal this connection to earth as well and give this community a chance for um, sustaining themselves that way too. Hmm. Yeah, it's almost like you, in order to change your stance, you have to give up everything and nothing. Say like more. You have, to, you have to, you know, I think about like time, like just applying it to my own personal life, like times when a, an apology was the best thing I could do. Mm. And boy, was that going to cost me. Boy, was I not going to mm. do that. Mm. And yet, and yet it costs nothing and it gives me the world. And so mm. to be able to say, okay, I'm going to extend, like when you talk about the two, you know, the two different rooms, the black room, the dark room and the light room, um, that, that like what power looks like if I choose it is the choice of kindness. Mm. Right. So, I'm, you know, I'm thinking a little bit of Martin Luther King Jr. here. I'm thinking of Gandhi. Um, one, I don't know. Do you know the book uh, Shantaram? Oh, I love the book Shantaram. Right. The first paragraph when he talks about, um, you know, he's being tortured, chained up. And he says, like, what, what, what it comes down to is I have the power to hate my torturers or to forgive mm. them. And, and, mm. and, and, that was, and that difference was everything. It's like, I'm hearing you saying that rather than fawning and appeasing and giving over our power, what you're talking about is really claiming it to, to, to the hilt. Absolutely. That's right. And, you know, the Buddha, someone once came to the Buddha wanting to kill the Buddha, you know, and they brought a big stick in order to strike the Buddha down. <laughs> and the Buddha said, hey, you know, I know that you're about to give me something, maybe give me a blow, you know, fine. But let me just ask you a question. You know, what happens to a gift that the receiver refuses? And the, the person said, I guess it stays with the giver, the person who wants to give it. And the Buddha said, I refuse your hate. <laughs> and it really, then it was this moment of this person saying like, oh, this hate is with me you know, and they drop the stick and they, you know, and, and that's, you know, this isn't about appeasement. This is about saying your message that I am not 
that I do not have power is not true. Your message that I don't belong is not true. I'm something luminous and incomparable and unique in this world. And, and I get to express my love for my home and my family. I also get to express my, my desire for safety and well-being. And I get to express to you who has the power to do something about this situation that I appreciate you for what you've done. And I also see you can do more. And I invite you to step into that. You know, that is very different than, oh, let me just give you whatever you want or let me, you know, let, let me just accept the script that you've laid out or the dynamic you've laid mm -hmm. out. That's very different. So the opposite of, of fighting back with force is not, um, is not something like, you know, because you, when you fight with force, in fact, you are accepting the premise, right? That the, that someone attacking you is putting forth. They're saying, these are the rules of the game. I don't like you and I want to hurt you, you know? And you say, okay, I accept the premise. So I'm going to fight you and I want to hurt you now. Like that's mm. in a way you have appeased, you know what I'm saying? Mm. And when, when you uh -huh. say, I'm not going to accept that whole story at all. That story is wrong. I'm going to throw a kindness party. I'm going to shake your hand. I'm going to show you what I can do for this community. And, and then you can, you can then tell me, you know, what game you want to play now. Like, do you want to keep playing this game of throwing bottles at me when I did this for this community, you know, hmm. that you live in, that you're part of, that you now feel more safe in, that you got free resources from? Is that what you want to do? Like, I fed you from this. Is that what you want to do? Who must you be in order to do that? Is that who you want to be? That is an extraordinary act of power. That's saying, I hmm. have the freedom of mind and heart to take the script that you have given and say no. And there's a new script I want to offer. That I think is, that's the power that we're talking about here. Wow, goosebumps. So people, people will want to hear more. They will want to follow your work and your writing and your thinking. How can they do so? Um, yeah, well, uh, you could check out our website, gatherfar.org. Or you can check say, out say, our say, say that say that a little slower and spell it, please. Sure, I'm sorry. Uh, Gatherfor.org is our website. So, so F -O -R, G -A gather four. Yes, yeah, gather f o r one word dot o r g, and um, you can also check out our medium page, gatherfor.medium.com, um, where we I've, I've written a bit about this story. I'm going to be writing more about it as well. Some of our work, some of our our inspirations. Um, you know, you and I, how we talked before about the Blackfoot and um, and how they've inspired us, their practice of community and collective care. Um, and there are a lot of these these indigenous and ancestral teachers that we learn from. You know, our work, it's not new. It's not innovative. It's uh, uh -huh. it's borrowing from a rich tradition of, of what others have done before that we're trying to to you know, plant those seeds in, in this soil of our current modern context. So yeah, that's, uh, that's where people can learn more about our, our work. Beautiful. Teju, thank you so much. I'm, I feel so filled and hopeful and, and just empowered. Like, like I don't need to go get more power. I have, I have everything that I need. And you just reminded me of that. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Howie, for having me. All right. Well, then thanks for taking the time once again. And I look forward to continu continuing conversations as, uh, as you um, sh shine light on these ancient practices that are, are still innovative. <laughs> Thank you, Howie. I appreciate it. I appreciate that what you're doing with your podcast, you know, creating space, asking questions, listening, learning. I, I think it's just so um, it's, a, it's an amazing gift that you're offering us all, you know, by taking the time to do that. So thank you for what you, the heart and the time that you're investing in, in, in this gift for us all. Mm, music to my ears. It's uh, it's my gift to myself. So I'm glad it's my gift to others as well. <laughs> I hope you get to continue enjoying Spain. Um, how wonderful that you're there. And uh, yeah, really appreciate getting connected yeah. with you as always, Howie. Yep. Thank you so much. Uh, take care and we'll talk again soon. I hope. Sounds good. Bye, Howie. Okay.